boot. Flight pack. We could get some decouplers. A uh, radial engine mount would kind of be nice. Inline clampotron. And there's some structural segments. I was kind of looking for those, those when I was building just recently. Apollo docking module. I think it's a little bit early for docking. Fairing base, I think. Hmm. Wonder if those are adjustable fairing bases. Ooh, SAS. I would like SAS. That's a hundred. I think we'll probably Is that probe sized air envelope. I think we'll probably end up getting that. Ooh. That is all of or most of Inferno Robotics. Okay, so we're getting this and this one cuz I've been I've been wanting those recently. That's like hinges and er, it's like hinges and stuff. Uh, so you can make articulated stuff. Like there's a bunch of stuff that I wanted to pack into the fairing, but I couldn't because it was too wide. Now I won't have that problem. We start the fifth episode returning to our ScanSat probe, which is still on a polar orbit and has nearly completed its mapping of the entire planet. 99.6% is good enough for this low resolution mapping probe. It has mapped roughly 5.1 times 10 to the seventh squared kilometers. That's 510 million kilometers. And for anyone still using the Imperial system, that's 316 million miles. Gaining a minuscule amount of science, we leave it in orbit to eventually decay and burn up due to the small amount of friction imparted on it by the almost non-existent atmospheric particles in the mid thermosphere. So I tried building a blimp again. I guess it's more of a a blimp aircraft hy hybrid. I'm calling it an airship. Let's just let's let's stick with airship that uh, describes it quite well. The buoyancy control allows for very small amount of runway for takeoff and landing, which means that it's really good at landing in rough terrain or small patches of smooth terrain. Unfortunately, it doesn't have reverse thrusters. That's kind of something that a, a little bit of an oversight there that I will probably add in. We're still in the very early stages of testing this thing. This is actually only the second flight. Uh, this is a high altitude test see how high in the atmosphere we can actually get. I have previously done one other test flight to establish the aerodynamic stability of it, just doing some minor tweaks to make sure that it's properly balanced. But in any case, it uh, flies better than any plane that I've previously constructed, so that's good. Like right now we're doing uh, 180 meters per second, that's 400 miles per hour, and we're at 60 degrees ascension. Well, 83 degrees if you got that on the display. It does have quite a nice cockpit. This is actually a B9 capsule. Bob is going nuts. Um, you might be wondering why I have so many radial air intakes on the bottom facing the wrong way. Uh, besides making it look really awesome, it provides a nice skid for a water landing. Um, as the radial air intakes are extremely hydrophobic, actually a little bit too much so as you'll see here in a bit. Um, I'm running this at four times just in case you didn't know and we did a little bit of skip there. Actually I'm varying between like two times and four times and eight times. Uh, the, the primary goal of this flight was to do a high altitude test and we completed that. I could have gone a little bit higher um, but yeah, we're just coming in for a landing now. We've got the engines off. 
and I'm just kind of slowly trying to touch down. I get really wary when I, whenever I touch into water because it seems to be such a devastating force in this game. More so than the land. I'm not sure why that is. I wonder if that's just something that I think or if that's, that's everybody. And then we get a little bit of uh, slowed frame right here. You don't, you're not seeing too much of it now because it's at uh, two times. But when I was playing, it dropped like 10 frames as soon as I touched the water. So yeah, I definitely should add some reverse thrusters on that, on the main body or something to slow it down. Of course, I also could replace the radial air intakes for a proper skid and that would give us enough friction to slow down in a more reasonable amount of time. Uh, so yeah, we attempted the water takeoff and it was nice and successful and we're just coming around for a uh, land landing. And again, to demonstrate the its capability at landing at slow speeds and not taking up very much runway. I'm hoping to eventually shuttle some science experiments around, um, you know, get them to different biomes and possibly use this as a high altitude launcher. I think I'd have to add some more balloon parts to it or possibly reduce the weight. We'll see how that goes. I might just scrap this design entirely in favor of something that gets us around a little bit quicker since we don't have to worry about a budget yet. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. The big flat surfaces on the front and well, it's primarily the front make it kind of difficult to control. I added those surface, I added those control surfaces on the outsides and the top, which make it a little bit better. But it still could be controlled. Uh, it still could be a little bit more easier to control. We are going back to the moon, this time ditching the chance of a return to do a low flyby. So the Russian Luna 2 was an impactor. I talked a little bit about that before. The United States had Pioneer 4, which passed within 60 megameters of the moon's surface. As we speed through the launch, ascent, and circularization, I should mention that we aren't going to be leaving low Earth orbit during this episode. For that, you'll have to wait until next time. Devoid of context, I would like to remind you to enjoy your pancakes. This has been Grim doing rocket science so you don't have to.